All right, good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Garrett Allen with the AGC. Just a few quick um, comments before I turn over to today's speaker. This is the second. Sorry about that. Uh, the second version of our legal series. I think we'll get it started back up in January and try and go basically monthly um, starting in 2020. So today's topic is um, the circumstances that I think any organization is going to run into where you bring someone aboard, um, you think it's going to work out, there's a lot of excitement, and then they, they get into the job and, and things go wrong and you got to do something about it and you want to make sure you handle it the right way. Um, do you fake a hip injury for the guy so he doesn't embarrass himself on, <laughs> on public television um, like the Bears? <laughs> Sorry for that thing. Um, there's better ways to handle it than that, most likely. So what we brought in uh, from Ron Greason and Roper is Kyle Gulia. He handles um, this type of thing sort of all day, every day. So he's nice enough to come in here, and hopefully he can give you some tips so you don't have to call him in the future and, and help him um, you know, put a swimming pool or a new deck on his house because could you avoid it in the first place? So he's been nice enough to come in. Um, again, he works on this type of stuff all day, every day. And I will say from my experience as a litigator, these are very thorny issues and just handling it, um, you know, with, without a legal expertise, or without any legal background at all, you can really step on some landmines. I'm sure Kyle's gonna cover a couple of those. So if you guys in positions of HR, um, supervising those type of things, it is an area where uh, you gotta be careful. So that's the, the plan for today is to make sure that, um, you know, you're not gonna know the whole treatise on it, but you'll know hopefully enough and when something comes up, you say, there's something to this. I need to look into this more. Um, I need to talk to an attorney, something like that. So with that, I'll turn it over to Kyle. Thanks. Good morning, everybody. Um, I want to thank everybody online for attending and for the attendees that are here in person. Thanks to all of you. Um, I've been practicing in the area of management side labor and employment law for over 15 years. And what I've learned over my entire career is that managers have a really difficult time with one aspect of the discipline process, and it's not firing people. Firing people at the end of the day is easy compared to this very important first step when you're dealing with an employee who engages in misconduct. And that's that initial stage of discipline, whether it's a written reprimand or even a verbal reprimand reduced to writing, just doing it. And oftentimes I'll ask a supervisor, how come we haven't disciplined this person? And the common response that I get from the supervisor is almost the same. I didn't know what to do, or I didn't know what to write, or I didn't know how to handle the situation or I didn't want to make the employee mad. I was concerned about the employment relationship deteriorating if that person was not managed properly. And those are easy things to overcome at the end of the day. I'm going to talk to you for about the next hour as I read from you verbatim from the PowerPoint presentation. Just kidding. Uh, as, it, as it relates to a lot of good practical tips for overcoming those issues. Likewise, the same concept holds true when we have an employee who is not performing to standard, whether we're going to evaluate them and give them a negative performance evaluation. The crux issue with discipline and with evaluations is that they both rest on the concept that we owe it to the employee to be an honest person with them. We expect honesty from them. They need honesty from us. It needs to be constructive, it needs to be critical. But how do we get to good decision making is really the important context because I also ask supervisors, why didn't you ever even look into the problematic behavior? And they'll say, because I didn't know what to do. What I want you to walk away from the next hour with understanding is, is how do you get to a position where you can make a really good decision? Now, looking at the PowerPoint presentation itself, there's a couple of things that I think are very important as to why we do what we do. Of course, litigation avoidance is an important consideration. What I look at it as is we want to create an environment of deterrence where employees will respect our decision making, where they will look at us as being good, competent managers who have the company's core vision, mission, and values at heart which is highly undebatable for an employee who wants to work for the organization to, to try to contravene that expectation. But nonetheless, if we can create an environment of deterrence where they respect our decision making, that makes it so they are less inclined to want to challenge. I also find that a good process where we investigate fairly, where we discipline fairly, is respectful of the rights that the employee has. When you respect their rights, the employee is more accepting of the outcome. And likewise, at the end of the day, 
when we are making decisions that are grounded in legitimate, good, non-discriminatory reasons, and when we're treating similarly situated employees in a similar manner, we're going to have a really good defense to any sort of discrimination claim that may come our way. Now, whenever we're investigating and dealing with these issues, one of the few times I'm going to read from the PowerPoint, but because it's really important, what's our goal when we're investigating? It's to uncover and gather information to a high degree of accuracy, to understand the objective facts, to establish and conduct a lawful, fair, and credible process to reduce or eliminate uncertainty and to prevent surprise, i.e., we want to make certain that when the employee is raising an issue, that we're not just ignoring that issue where they indicate, I don't think I'm being treated fairly, you let Sally get away with this issue all the time, that we're able to address those concerns that the employee has through further investigation. But we got to know what it is first so that the first time we're not learning about that surprise issue is when they file a discrimination claim. Likewise, we want to know the challenges to evidence that may exist, the challenges to the process that the employee may raise, the challenges to the concept of fairness that may exist, so that we can get to the end point of having a good, meaningful decision. Now, supervisors will often say, Kyle, this is a real wasteland that I got to navigate through. What's a good guidepost for me? The most important guidepost in my mind is the mission, vision, and values of the company. If you know the mission, vision, and values of the company, that will help you make the decisions that you need to make. You will understand what the core values are, whether the core value of the employer is to treat employees with respect and dignity, whether the core value is to engage in honesty and integrity in your interactions with others. Understand what those are. That will help you with the decision making. More importantly, if you're a manager and you do not know the mission, the core values, and the vision of your company, how can you supervise truly? You have to know those things. When you're on the witness stand, it is amazing when a supervisor demonstrates that lack of knowledge. It shows what I would refer to as incompetency. But we also need to make certain that our employees are held to that standard as well. Put yourself in this position. You're conducting an investigatory interview of the employee. And the question is posed to the employee where we're trying to gauge the employee's knowledge of the rules expect and expectations of conduct. And we say to the employee the very simple question, can you tell us what the core values of our company are? And all that the employee has to do is look over our left shoulder because on a poster on the wall in our office are the core values. And if the employee can't even recognize that, are they just here for the job to earn a paycheck? Or are they here because they really truly want to be here and they embrace what the company is trying to do? But all of that starts at the hiring process phase two. How we train people, how we hire people matters. But if you're ever looking for a guidepost for decision making, look to the core values, look to the mission, look to the vision of the company. I'm going to talk about a lot of different legal traps in the first part of the presentation today. Those are going to be issues involving employee job security, knowing whether the employee is at will or whether there's a contract in place or policy in place that provides to them some other alternative standard like just cause or some other framework. We'll talk about Weingarten rights. We'll talk about the concept of searches in generality. And then we're going to talk about basic fundamental fairness. For those of you that are unionized employers, if you have to go to arbitration, what is an arbitrator going to look for in that arena? A couple of other things I just want to touch on before we get into the real, the real legal traps issues involve the issues of law enforcement related investigations and arrest record discrimination. This is very important. There is a strong inclination by the employer to let the criminal process run its course before the employer manages the employment situation. In 98% of the circumstances that I deal with, which is a lot of investigations, we run the internal investigation concurrent to the criminal investigation. We do not try to interfere with the criminal investigation. We have the ability to share information with law enforcement investigating authorities. But by running the investigation concurrently, we are able to ensure that evidence does not become stale, that evidence is properly collected, that we are able to understand chain of custody. But more important, since none of us want to be bigots, under Wisconsin law, we need to ensure that we're not engaging in what is called arrest record discrimination. And as long as we are conducting our own investigation and not relying wholeheartedly for our decision making based on the criminal investigation, we're going to be able to avoid an arrest record discrimination claim. If we wait for the criminal process to unfold, 
you never know what the district attorney is going to do. They may enter into a no prosecution agreement or a deferred prosecution agreement. They may enter into a completely reduced charge that completely undermines your ability to truly manage the employee based upon what that outcome is if you simply wait for that so that you can rely upon what I would refer to as a conviction. Long story short, when we're dealing with those issues, we want to preserve the defense for the company. And if we're aware that the employee is engaged in conduct that has a criminal component to it, whether it's on the job or off the job, if there is a relationship back to the employment, we want to begin the process of at least examining it and investigating it on our own to decide whether there's any employment decisions that need to be made. After I'm done talking about the legal side of things, we're going to switch gears and Kyle's going to tell you from a practical standpoint, what do you need to do? So employee job security, knowing what your employee is, is a core element, whether the employee is an at will employee and the employee can fire himself or herself, they can decide to quit for any reason or no reason and with or without notice. That's what at will employment is for the employee, for the employer. At will employment means that we can terminate the employee without notice or with notice for no reason or for any lawful reason. With regard to that concept though, in order to effectively defend against discrimination claims, we have to be able to articulate a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. So no matter what, we're gonna wanna have that legitimate non-discriminatory reason for any disciplinary decision or any termination decision of the employee. There are some employers that have decided to take a kinder, gentler approach with their employees. They move away from the general at-will concept and they'll adopt some other standard. Employees will be disciplined when a rational basis exists to do so, or employees may be disciplined for cause. We have to know what cause means in those circumstances. Hopefully the employer has taken the time and the policy to define it. You as a manager need to know though whether that exists, so read the policies of the organization. Likewise, if there's a collective bargaining agreement in place and the parties have agreed that there's a just cause standard, arbitrators will apply different standards of just cause depending on the circumstances if the employer and the union have not defined just cause. And it may be a traditional seven tests of just cause, it may be a modified framework of just cause. At the end of the day, it doesn't matter because if you properly handle these steps, you're going to be able to fulfill whatever burden that arbitrator puts in front of you. You're going to be able to articulate a legitimate non-discriminatory reason. So if there is an investigation conducted by an equal rights division investigator, you're going to be able to get them to understand that there's a legitimate basis for what we did that is completely unrelated to the employee's protected status. Now, there are also in some nuanced circumstances, for example, the employee files a workers' comp claim where we have to demonstrate a reason that is fair, just, and fit under the circumstances when we are taking employment action against that employee. When you go back to the traditional Doherty seven tests of just cause standard uh, concept, that actually gives a good framework for the investigation. Just cause is never a measurement of the employee themselves. It is a measurement of management's efforts. And if you understand the concept of management's efforts and you follow this concept from an investigation standpoint, I think you're gonna be able to make good defensible decisions. The traditional concept, did the employee know what he or she was expected to do, that they could be disciplined for violating a rule or expectation of conduct? We have to be able to show that. We're gonna be able to show that through policy acknowledgement forms. Our investigation will reveal that. We're gonna be able to show that by asking the employee, what were you trained to do? We might even have training certificates. After all, those training certificates that we give to employees are not merits of accomplishment or participation trophies. They're to be rolled up into whack people with when they engage in misconduct. We're gonna be able to show that the employee knew what was expected of him or her through evaluative documents. We're gonna be able to show based on their knowledge of other employees who engaged in misconduct and that employee was aware that that in other individual was terminated or was disciplined as a result. We're gonna be able to show that the employee knew what was expected from him or her if we do a good hiring process. And for example, during the job interview, we ask good, meaningful job-related questions. I have a chief of police that I work with from a law enforcement agency. One of the things that he will do for a law enforcement officer candidate is during the interview process, he will ask the candidate, 
in the event that you go to a store and you're employed here, you go into a store and you take a pack of gum without paying for it, what are you going to do about it? And then he has a matrix of an optimal answer, an acceptable answer, and an unacceptable answer. And the optimal answer, of course, is I'd resign, chief. That person, good. We like that candidate. 99% of people don't get that answer. Instead, they'll give the standard acceptable answer, which is, chief, I'd expect to be disciplined. I'd expect to be fired about it if you found out about it. And then if they give an unacceptable answer, for example, well, chief, if you found out about it, you got to do what you got to do. Or, you know, I'd probably just put it back and uh, go pay the clerk and say nothing more about it. They don't get hired. But fast forward seven years down the line, and the employee engages in an integrity-based um, act where they have compromised their integrity, where they have been deceptive. And during the investigative process, the individual, when they are interviewed, is asked, when you were interviewed by us as part of the job, do you remember the question that you were asked about shoplifting, about integrity? And they'll say, no. And then you might have to pull out your notes and remind them. Or they'll say, yes. And then you'll say, do you remember what your answer was? Because this cuts to the heart of what we are as an organization. And they'll say, uh, remind me. And you'll say, you said you'd quit. What do you think they're going to do under the circumstances? If you have that framework built up from the hiring process of training people what to do, you're going to be able to be in a good position to make good employment decisions later on. Every interview question matters. That's why we don't ask people, what are your hobbies? We don't care what their hobbies are. And their hobbies have no relationship to the job. We ask some good pointed questions that allow us to help manage that person later on. Likewise, we want to test whether our rules or expectations of conduct are reasonable. It's a fair question to ask the individual. You've been late for work on 10 different occasions. We have an attendance standard that we have enforced with you on each occasion. Do you believe that our attendance standard is reasonable for the effective operation of our company? If they say yes, you ask them, please explain your answer. If they say no, you ask them, please explain your answer. Because if they answer no, there's probably not going to be a good reasonable explanation that you're going to get from them. But at least we can see what type of person we're dealing with and whether we can truly manage that person. Because at the end of the day, remember, most disciplinary situations, you're keeping the person. Your objective is to really understand what's going on in their head and to figure out how do I manage that person going forward understanding where their value system is at, understanding where their perspective of the company is at is a core thing that you get from an investigation. We want to conduct a complete and thorough investigation and we want our effort to be fair. That's of course where tests three and four come into play. When we're conducting a fair investigation, that means that the person that's doing the investigation shouldn't have been previously sleeping with the employee's spouse. Um, let's find somebody else to do the job. The fact, though, that the individuals have had run-ins in the past where they were previously disciplined by that person or where they are under a, uh, a performance improvement plan by the supervisor, the supervisor, of course, can still investigate the matter, of course, can still make good, important decisions. And then we get to the concept of proof. Do we got some evidence? Do we got reliable evidence? Or are we relying upon our best friend, sister's boyfriend's girlfriend who saw that uh, Ferris passed out at the 31 Flavors last night? Let's have good, reliable evidence in that regard. Are we treating our employees fairly? With how we're dealing with Bob, we got Sally sitting over here who's a similarly situated employee, similar record of service, similar duration of service. Are we meting out the same level of disciplinary consequence? Or if we're not, what's the legitimate justification as to why we're treating Bob differently? And then test seven is an analysis of the person's record of service. You get somebody that's been tardy but their record of service reflects a series of other issues where they are the league leader in the company for suspension days, that tardiness might be sufficient to get them fired as compared to another employee who's got nothing on their record, i.e., what's the employee's relative worth to the organization? Now, for my unionized friends in the audience here, when we have an employee who's unionized and has a reasonable belief that the discussion with the supervisor might lead to disciplinary consequence, the employee may request to have a union representative present. 
And under those circumstances, you'll let them have a representative present. You're still going to get your questions answered. The representative, they certainly may be obstinate, but you're going to have a laser focus during that meeting on the employee. You communicate with the employee. You pose your questions to the employee. If the employee is not answering your questions truthfully and completely, you order the employee to answer the questions truthfully and completely. Anytime you're asking a work-related question as it relates to the performance of their job functions, you have that authority to order them to answer the question. And if they violate your order, that's insubordination, that's a terminable offense for some employers. But you have to, again, understand the company's mission, vision, and values to understand whether with your employer, whether it meets that standard. Likewise, let the representative do their job. Let them represent the employee. Oftentimes, we need the representative to be able to lean on the employee to help the employee make a good decision. But nonetheless, the employee also needs to, be, needs to feel like they are being treated fairly. And if you're stonewalling the representative and telling the representative that they're a potted plant and need to sit in the corner of the room and say nothing, you've lost. Now you, it rises to the level where the arbitrator may chuck out the investigatory interview from an evidentiary standpoint and say that they're not even going to allow it into the record because of what just happened. And under those circumstances, your entire case, essentially a house of cards, has fallen apart. And of course, the arbitrator is going to overturn the discipline. But it doesn't give the representative the right to run roughshod over you. Certainly, if the representative wants to ask a clarifying question based on a question that you asked, let them chime in. If the representative wants to take a break and caucus, let them. They might be going to go play sheep's head. Who cares? You're going to get your interview done at some point. The representative may want to ask a clarifying question to the employee. Sometimes that can be very helpful. Think about how you look during the process. Oftentimes, we're concerned, what if the representative is going to behave badly? Fine, record the interview. That's your note-taking. Think about people on TV. The only time that people really misbehave on TV is when there's a major sporting event going on, such as winning a championship, which people in Chicago would not know much about recently. Uh, but here nor there, hopefully the Packers know what it's all about this year, but here nor there, um, under those circumstances, but if you're in a room and in an investigatory interview, the recording of the interview may be very beneficial to getting good behavior. Now, with all of that said, what about employers? What do you do under the circumstances? If you think the meeting may lead to disciplinary consequence, be upfront with the employee. Say, listen, I'm dealing with a serious situation. I'm concerned about this matter here. And if they have that right to have a representative present, you can tell them, look, if you want to have a rep present, go nuts. That's fine. Let's schedule the interview. That will save delay. It will also show fairness because why should you be fearful about them bringing someone into the room? You can avoid the delays in the process. Now, as it relates to the representative themselves, like I said earlier, they have the right to represent. That means they can participate in the process. We may be concerned about the concept of interference. What if the representative is doing something to the effect of saying to the individual, you were asked a yes or no answer. You need to give it a yes or no answer. Ready? Don't sweat over it. The employee is the one who's accountable for his or her answers. If that employee is going to lie or they're going to get bad advice from the representative, it is what it is but the law is going to give a lot of leeway right now to the representative in that regard. Moreover, if the representative wants to take a break and they're gonna go out in the hallway and they're gonna coach the employee, your job is to make certain that you're not sticking to a fixed question list and that you are able to maneuver your questions so that you can get to the truth. If the employee and the representative are trying to coach their way around the truth, your job is to dig. You don't ask them about what they were doing out in the hallway but you got every right under the circumstance to have that person answer your questions that are unrelated to the advice that they're getting from their representative that are unrelated to the discussions that they have with their representative. Now, you may hear about individuals who have a right to have an attorney present. We often watch the news and we see that a law enforcement officer may have the right to have a, a legal counsel present. They have a specific statutory right to have someone who's other than a union representative or other than a coworker present. Otherwise, in general, the employee does not have a right to have private legal counsel present. Now, with all that said, understand your policies and your collective bargaining agreements. 
It's not uncommon for an employer to use a national association who gives them a standard stock policy and the employer says, well, we paid $800 for this policy manual. It must be good. No, you have to make certain that the policies reflect the reality of your organization and you, employer, are accountable for the policies that you adopt. And as a manager, you need to know what those policies are. Employee searches are a real big issue. This is where policy can be very helpful. The general construct is, is that if there is something that is ours, i.e. the employer's, we generally have a right to search that area provided that the employee doesn't have a reasonable expectation of privacy. Think about the concept of intrusion. What would be highly intrusive to you as a reasonable person? We as the employer are, of course, not going to put up security cameras in the bathroom. But if we need to go and search an employee's desk or the employee's computer, we want to make certain that the, we understand the practical reality. Is the employee keeping a lot of personal effects? in their desk? Are they keeping a lot of personal communications on the computer? Having a good policy that tells employees, when you're using our electronic communication systems, you should have no reasonable expectation of privacy. We reserve the right to monitor our system, to access records at any time for legitimate workplace reasons, so that the employee can't say, how could you have gone in and found the communications with my mistress? You're such an awful human being. I really am in disgusted employer that you would have done such a thing because now I'm gonna end up in a divorce. We wanna make certain employees understand policy. Second thing, anytime we're conducting a search, we wanna start the search narrow. If we're gonna search an area where the employee might have an expectation of privacy, we give them a locker and they're allowed to put their own lock on the locker and we're looking for a missing dump truck. Are we gonna search the locker? Are we gonna find the missing dump truck in the locker? Probably not. So are we gonna search the locker? Probably not. We may not look at that zone. Likewise, anytime that we're dealing with computer-based searches or electronic record searches, we wanna start narrow. Now a cautionary note for any supervisor, do not ever, 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 ever ask the employee to provide you with login information or password information on a social media account, email account, whatever it may be, or on a personal device. Even a work-related device you wanna be exceptionally careful about, this is where you as a manager need to get absolute help. I can't cover in 10 minutes the various laws that come into play under that arena, particularly because many of those laws are simply not developed. We are dealing with applicable state laws, we're dealing with the Stored Communications Act, we're dealing with other laws that are very complex and have significant damage exposure for those who violate it. That's not to say that we can't manage those situations. It is to say, though, that we have to be exceptionally methodical in how we go about it. So what if law enforcement is involved? What if we're cooperating with criminal investigators as part of a criminal investigation where we're doing a concomitant concurrent internal investigation? Can we conduct searches and can we share information with law enforcement? The general construct is, yes, we have that ability to do so. How we do it is what matters. Likewise, can law enforcement share information with us? Oftentimes they can, whether they choose to though, depends on whether they desire to engage in any conduct that may contravene the integrity of their criminal investigation. Nonetheless, your investigation should reflect efforts that you've undertaken to get that information from them that there's no way that you could have otherwise gotten on your own. So as some other problematic legal zones to be mindful of, confidentiality orders. Oftentimes we wanna to say to an employee, we're investigating a very serious issue of you being late to work yesterday. You're prohibited from talking to anyone about this matter. Is an order of that even necessary? Obviously, if the order relates to an issue where if they were to talk to other people, it may tip off a co-conspirator, but in a lateness situation, there's nothing like that that we're probably dealing with. If we're dealing with a situation where them talking to other people may lead to intimidation of a witness, for example, a sexual harassment investigation, or lead to intimidation of a target of behavior, or lead to the potential destruction of evidence, or worse, may lead to a safety risk for another. There we may have a legitimate business reason for issuing a confidentiality order, but that order's not generally in perpetuity. It probably has a life expectancy to it. Typically, 
of the duration of the investigation or of the duration that interviews are going about. Anytime that you're thinking about a confidentiality order, give some thought as to those matters, but obviously talk to someone in human resources or figure out what's the appropriate approach to that confidentiality directive. Anytime you're dealing, my view, with a confidentiality directive, there's going to be an anti-retaliation directive that goes along with it. That retaliation directive essentially says, we do not operate a middle school here. We treat each other as professionals with respect and dignity. That's a core value of our company. And when you are interacting with individuals related to this investigation or who may be involved in this investigation, the expectation is, is that you will not engage in any behavior that is ostracizing or cold shouldering or retaliatory or seeking retribution in any manner. And if you engage in such behavior, then the wrath of hell shall come down upon you. Because after all, if you want to have a culture in your workplace where people treat each other like garbage, those are the people that will do it. And if you don't give out that instruction, you should expect that that type of cold shouldering and factionalism will evolve and will crush the culture of the, of the organization. A couple other quick things. If we got a unionized environment and the union says, we want to see the witness statements, when do they get them? Typically, when you're thinking about discipline, when you're going to give the employee an opportunity to be heard, there may be a duty to share at that point in time. Whether it's all the discipline statements is one issue. Whether it's redacted discipline statements may be another issue. If you get a request for that nature, get help from human resources or get help from outside counsel. And then likewise, if you're in the investigation process and there are certain tactics that you want to take, for example, telling the union, hey, um, we heard the employees say this during the interview. Can you verify this right here and sign the notes to that effect? Think about what the effect is on that and whether you need to do that. Your better approach rather than having them sign notes is video record the interview. Body language captures a tremendous amount of things. And that leads me to what I want to talk about next, which are what are the investigative tasks that the supervisor should do? The very first and most important thing is what kind of notes are you going to take? An investigation plan, in my view, is what you refer to it. It's a living, breathing document. Whenever you're drafting notes, whether it's notes that you take on a notepad or whether it's a Microsoft Word document, every scribble that you put down has to have meaning. That means that you should be comfortable with somebody on a jury seeing what you are marking from that standpoint. Well, Kyle, how about I just not take notes then? I don't know what kind of memory you have, but I generally don't remember what I was doing six years ago today. And in order for us to make good defensible decisions, having good notes is a really helpful thing in that regard to have. So taking good notes is an important consideration. Well, Kyle, then what do we put into our notes? Let me tell you. Here's a laundry list. You put in a description of the allegation. What's the allegation of wrongdoing that you're looking into, i.e. the facts? Who was involved? When did it occur? What happened? Where did it occur? Identify what the reason is for the investigation. The reason is going to be very simple at the end of the day. We are dealing with a potential violation of Rule 68.136, subsection HR4 of the organization's policies involving absenteeism. Perfect. Because at the end of the day, you'll have some employees that'll say, this is just a fishing expedition or this is a witch hunt. What better position to be in to say, I don't have time for fishing expeditions and I certainly don't have time, times for witch hunts. I'm investigating a violation of a rule or policy that will help keep you grounded. Oftentimes it may not be a specific rule. A lot of you do not have a policy within your organization prohibiting sex with animals, but you may have another policy that comes into play with regard to a becoming conduct standard or a professionalism standard. And that will be the guidepost for you. And when in doubt, refer back to that mission, vision, and values. Not that anyone ever has sex with animals at work. Good. With all of that said, Keep a list of the evidence that you collected. Keep a list of where you got it and who you got it from. When you're having pertinent meetings during the investigation, keep a listing of what those meetings are, whether it's a cooperative meeting with a law enforcement agency. Identify who was involved, when the meeting occurred, and what the matters were that were discussed. But you will never, ever, 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 in your investigation plan, document the meetings that you had with the lawyer. Whether it's the company's lawyer or outside counsel that goes outside of your notes, you put that in a separate privilege log. Here's why. 
if your investigation plan is going to be used by the employer as notes in a discrimination case, as evidence, when you're testifying on the witness stand and we got to black out from your notes all of the attorney-client privilege discussions that you had, how does that look to the decision maker? It looks like you're hiding something. People are never concerned in those situations with the good work that you did. They're constantly wondering what's inside the box. That's what they're thinking the whole time. Don't even create the avenue for that. Keep a separate privilege log in that regard. If you have communications with law enforcement, like I said, document those events and then other pertinent events that occur during the investigation and keep revising the notes. The reason why I suggest this format is because when you're preparing a report potentially on the matter or a summary or whether you're preparing the discipline letter, you're going to be in a wonderfully good position to be able to write a good report or a good letter if you do the note taking the right way. So. What do you do? You walk into work and something bad happens. You find out about it, whether it's a coworker coming to you and reporting the matter to you, whether it's a concerned other contractor reporting the information to you, whether it's a phone call from your buddy over at the police department who's letting you know that so-and-so from your company just got picked up for punching out somebody at work. Document the allegation immediately. What do you write down? It's very simple, the facts. Who was involved? What happened? When did it occur? Where did it occur? If you can get the person who's the reporting party to write a statement, do that. A lot of times they will be apprehensive about it. Certainly you have it within your power to order a subordinate employee to write a statement as to what they observe. That's within your power to do so. Ordering, in my view, is probably a last resort. Your better approach is instead saying to the person that we are very proud of the professional environment that we have at our workplace. Our mission and values are furthered when people do things like bringing these matters to our attention. That's doing exactly the right thing. And by you coming into my office and reporting this to me, you've done what you need to do. And I greatly appreciate that, but I need to do one more step and I need you to document what it is. Well, everybody's going to refer to me as a snitch. We don't tolerate that type of behavior here. And that's exactly the type of culture that we are seeking to eradicate from this work environment. The only way that you'll get rid of that culture, folks, is with a lot of effort. But when people understand that bringing matters to the attention of management is the expected and appropriate thing to do, and that hiding things, being part of a veil of secrecy, is what gets people fired, is a way to break the cultural problem. Well, Kyle, I'm worried that they might kill me if I tell you this info. You know what? You're going to write a code name at the bottom of that, and I'm going to know your code name, and HR is going to know your code name. Now, we can't promise you confidentiality, but we'll do what we can to protect your identity for the time being. Might be a path that you have to take. Next thing that you're going to want to deal with are the procedural or policy issues that come into play. Understand what those policy requirements and expectations are. If you have a collective bargaining agreement, know what those requirements are. Next, if the issue is a theft, Anytime people call me up with a theft, they say, hey, Kyle, yeah, um, our finance person, uh, yeah, so, you know, like, you know, they never went on vacation or anything, and basically were pretty, like, tight, you know, with how they handled everything, and they knew the auditors because they were their best friend growing up. Um, we think they stole, like, five grand, and immediately, in my mind, I'm thinking it's 500 grand, um, but nonetheless, if there are reporting obligations that exist, make certain that we're reporting to the insurance company if we have a crime policy, make certain that we're reporting to law enforcement early on so that they can do their jobs. And then obviously we work within our organization. Determine whether you have to take any sort of preliminary activity. If the conduct that the individual engaged in is something that would probably get them fired and you want to investigate it first before making a rush decision, put them on leave. If they're an at-will employee, you can put them on leave without pay. If there's a criminal act, that there's a substantial relationship back to the job, i.e. the work environment presents the opportunity for recidivism, you have the ability to, to have that person put on leave during the pendency of the criminal process. Nonetheless, it may be that a transfer within the organization is appropriate. You get a sexual harassment complaint from one employee, the target of the behavior says, look, right now it's probably not good for he and I to work in the same environment. It may be that you transfer that other person or the target says, I'm willing to be transferred. Give those thoughts some, some, some consideration. Next step is, you immediately get into evidence preservation mode. If you let evidence spoil, that shows either A, that you don't care, 
It shows that you were careless during the investigation, or it shows potentially that you let evidence spoil that might have otherwise exonerated the employee. So we want to make certain that we're taking appropriate, appropriate efforts to preserve any evidence that comes to mind. One of the most common problems that I run through with a supervisor is the supervisor's strong desire to immediately confront the individual. An internal investigation, a personnel matter, is handled the exact same way that a criminal investigation is handled, i.e. the last person that you speak with is the accused. If you run and talk to the person about whom the misconduct involved, unless there's nobody else that you need to talk to. If you run and talk to them, you're walking into that meeting completely unprepared. And that's exactly the point that I'm trying to get across is be prepared, be methodical. Know the answers to the questions that they're going to relay, i.e. when you pose the, answer, the question to them, are you aware of our policy with regard to absenteeism? You already know the answer to that question because you looked in the personnel file, you saw the policy acknowledgement form, you trained that person on day one of their job, and you were there during the job interview with them when that person was asked, the normal hours of work for this position are 7 a.m. to 4 p.m. Can you fulfill that mainline expectation of performance of work during those hours? You know all those areas and you did the due diligence on your part to refresh your memory on it, to gather the records on it, so that when they answer that question, if they are honest with you, you can move on to the next one. If they don't remember, you can refresh their memory. And if they lie to you, you're in a position to confront the lie. But do your due diligence first. If there's people that you need to talk to, talk to them, then go talk to the accused. How do you deal with insiders and outsiders? Oftentimes, we have a strong inclination when a fellow contractor would say, hey, yeah, we heard about what happened with Benny over there the other day. What are you guys going to do with him? And you may be dealing with somebody that is a rumor monger or a gossip hound. What I like to do with rumor mongers and gossip hounds is not tell them it's none of your business. I like to tell them to take a seat. Anytime you got an office, if you got a spare chair in that office and you want to keep a person in that room so that you can talk to them, you tell them to take a seat. Why don't you have a seat? And then you say to them, it's interesting that you came in here because we are doing a thorough investigation into this matter. And by asking me about this, it demonstrates to me that you have relevant information. And in order for me to do my job effectively, I need to know what you know. So tell me what you know about the matter here. Well, you know, I was just interested. Well, there's more than that. What do you know? Well, nothing really. Okay, I'm going to put in my notes that you don't know nothing about this. But if you find out anything, I need you to tell me. You think they're ever going to bother you again with rumor mongering and gossip hounding? No, but you know what? You don't want them to bother you because they're annoying in the first place. With all of that said, that rule applies also with regard to internal folks. Now, what if the press comes a knocking and the press says, yeah, we heard about this issue, you know, here and everything. And maybe you can validate this for a supervisor because, hey, we got to write a story. And, you know, what better thing to be in the story is your side of the story versus nothing. And they're right because you're in public relations mode right now. And your best statement to say to them is never no comment. It looks awful to the public. You never say it's a confidential personnel matter. That's amateur hour, folks. People don't have any confidence in your business when they see foolish statements to that effect. Your response back to the reporter is, is give me your contact info. Someone from the company will get back to you and get it to the trained person within the company. And oftentimes the simple message is, is we take our vision and value seriously. We are a professional entity. And anytime there is a matter that rises into the public domain with regard to the conduct of our employees, we treat those matters seriously, period, done, end of story, that's your comment. That will instill at least a modicum of confidence in the public versus no comment, versus it's a confidential personnel matter. What did I tell the reporter? Nothing. Next thing that we want to deal with is, is, are there any orders that we need to consider as part of the investigation? I mentioned earlier about confidentiality orders. Be mindful of those. Orders to answer questions certainly are permissible under the circumstances when you're focusing on work-related work conduct. Think about where you're going to do the interview. Oftentimes, doing the interview in, the, in a particular environment may be more inclined to get the person to talk. That's a lot of thought that you need to give as the supervisor is, is what environment do I need to be in with this person that will get them to answer questions? 
whether it's a room with windows where people from the outside can see in, but they can't hear what's going on. Under those circumstances, individuals with a comfort level tends to go down, i.e. their willingness to talk goes up. They just want to get it done and over with. Sometimes being in the boss's office can be very problematic. Sometimes being in another location, though, might make more sense. Maybe the discreetness will help you get to the truth. Know who you're dealing with when you're asking a question. Simply sometimes just asking the question, letting them answer, and sitting there with 15 to 30 seconds of raw, brutal silence will get that person to open up. You ask them their name. They answer. You ask them who they work for and what they do. They answer. And then you just let the silence sit. And you ask them if they're aware of the rule or expectation of conduct. And you let the raw silence sit after the answer. And then you ask them what happened. And then they start talking. And each one of those questions that I was essentially asking there was not a yes or no question. It was a question designed to elicit a substantive response, and in particular, a narrative response, because we want the employee to talk. We want the employee to provide their side of the story when we're dealing with these issues. It's so important for you, the manager, to not pontificate when you're dealing with an investigatory issue. When you're metting out the discipline, is when you pontificate. Good? Good. All right. So there are some general tips for preparing for your meetings with the accused. I've covered a lot of these things already as to things that you should cover, but what do you actually ask them? What I like to ask them is, is never asking them from the get-go what happened. Don't. Don't, 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 don't. Start with what they understood they were supposed to do, i.e., are you familiar with the company's rules and regulations involving absenteeism or involving honesty or involving some other issue? How are you familiar with that expectation? Are you familiar with a particular safety protocol? How is it that you're familiar with that safety protocol? Are you obligated to be familiar with that safety protocol? Why are you obligated to be familiar with it? Well, OSHA standards require us to do so. That's what that OSHA investigation that we were involved in last year where you guys got dinged for 83,000 bucks told us. Hey, gotcha. Thanks for letting me know. Then we get into what does the rule require you to do or what does the training require you to do or what are you trained to do? After we get those questions answered, we're going to ask them, do you believe that these rules that we've identified to you are for the effective operation of the employer, for the effective operation of a construction entity, whatever it might be? Please explain your answer. Have you ever questioned the reasonableness of these rules to a supervisor? 99 times out of 100, the answer is going to be no. 99 times out of 100, they're going to say, I get it, your rules are legitimate, they're good, and they're reasonable. We do that because of fairness. We want the employee to understand. I want that employee to have what I call as a eureka moment where they understand they did something wrong. And after we ask them about that, we're not going to ask them about what happened yet. Instead, we're going to ask them about their record of service. Tell me about your record of service. How long have you worked here? What type of employee have you been? Are there any performance-related issues that have been addressed with you? What are those? Now we get into what happened on November 19, 2019 involving X, Y, and Z issue. I want to listen to your side of the story. It's very important for you to tell me what you know. That's where you get it, and that's when they will talk. And they will talk at that point. And you will be in a wonderful position as you listen to them, because you previously heard their explanation about what they were trained to do. And you'll be able to tell from their explanation, whether they are trying to give you a load of BS and trying to fit their conduct into the training and the rules and expectations of conduct, or whether the individual is going to be honest with themselves and have that eureka moment, and they're going to think to the, in their own mind, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. If you follow that framework, the employee will manage himself or herself. And you'll conclude the interview with a lot of other really good questions that are outlined in the outline here that you certainly can take and read. When you're dealing with other questions, anytime you're in doubt, some good general fact-based inquiries might be all that you need. You're sitting there thinking in your own mind when, with the employee, what should I ask him next? Then I ask him what happened? Then I ask the employee, when did this occur? Did I ask him who else was present? Did I ask him why those people were present? Did I ask the employee what they did? Did they ask the employee to give an explanation? Are all good, fair game questions. So when you're done, here's a good checklist of things that you should do. 
Look at your investigation plan. Did I do, did I cover the bases? Do I know where I got my evidence from? Do I really truly know what I was investigating? Did I fulfill that expectation? Review the investigation. Review any gaps that may need to be filled in. If there's other evidence that you have to secure, take the time to do it. Make a determination then. Make your decision as to how you're gonna manage the employee. Kyle, all this sounds like a lot of work. It's not. When you do it once, it's a lot of work. When you do it the fifth time, it's like right off the top of your head. I tell you this because this is training that I do for the same types of managers who work in the public sector arena and the law enforcement arena. Those people have a very important job to manage cops. You have a very important job to ensure that people that are building projects where the public enters those projects, that the public can have confidence in the safety of those buildings and the security of those buildings, and that those buildings aren't going to collapse on people. We have similar responsibilities and obligations. How you do it matters. And if you do it the right way and you develop good habits as a manager, you'll be able to undermine that core fear that exists where we don't want to discipline people because we don't know what to write and we don't know how. So, Kyle, what do we write? This is what you do. This is a letter. I like letters. I do not like forms. Forms to me are impersonal. A check the box form is read by an employee. Let me change that. It's not read by the employee. It's viewed by the employee and they go like that because it's impersonal. And it makes you as a manager look like you were really good at going like this and then writing down three words where you were supposed to provide a dissertation. A letter has a bigger effect. Think about your own personal life. If you had a major personal event occur in your life and somebody sent you a card that was a check the box card versus a personal letter, which one is going to have a greater effect on you? What I'm getting at is, is I want the employee to buy into the analysis. Writing a letter is not hard. The first time it will take you a long time. The second time it will be a heck of a lot easier. The third time you're going to say to yourself, holy cow, this letter sounds an awful lot like the other three letters that I've written or the other two letters that I've written because you're copying and pasting and plagiarizing yourself. And there's nothing wrong with that. And the reason for that is very simple. A lot of the issues that you're dealing with are going to be very simplistic. So what do you write? You got a letter of reprimand right in front of you here, folks. I want you to understand there are times where we as managers have not made good decisions. We let an employee slide. And oftentimes a manager may not want to discipline the employee because they feel that their past mismanagement of that employee is going to come back to haunt them. How do you deal with that? This letter shows how you deal with that scenario. So let's walk through this right here. What I want you to think about is, is, is this written? so that if an equal rights division investigator read this, they would understand what's going on. If a judge read it, if a jury read it, if your successor read it, and they were wondering whether you were a good manager of the people or whether they should curse your name for in perpetuity, because they can feel that you didn't do your job. That's who your audience is for this letter. Your audience for this letter, I hate saying it, might even be the front page of the newspaper. Because if somebody were to leak documents and the press were to get it, hey, why not publicize it? I've had my own communications on the front page of the paper. My mom would care that my grammar was proper, that I used proper vocabulary. Me, I just wanted to spell my last name right, but here, that, here and there, that's another issue. So let's look at this letter here. This tells somebody what I'm going to say is a story. This, by the end of the letter, will tell the reader that you are a good manager. On Monday, November 18, 2019, you were late for work for the 10th time since your date of hire on August 8, 2018. That tells us that we got an employee that's worked for us for one year, and they've been late 10 times. You were required to report for duty at 8 a.m. You reported for duty and clocked in at 8.46 a.m. We tell the reader that this person was 46 minutes late. At approximately 10.30 a.m., I spoke with you in the doorway of the break room and asked you why you were late. Why is that sentence in there? One, it tells the reader that you addressed the matter fairly promptly, i.e. an hour and 44 minutes after the employee was late. It also says where you had your discussion. That's for your knowledge. Here's why. 
I learned this trick from a manager. I asked him, every time I read a letter that you wrote, you write a description in there as to the location where you were when you, when you discussed the issue with the employee. Why do you do that? And he said, Kyle, six years ago, man, I don't know where the heck I was and what I was doing. If I write that in there, I read that and it takes me back to that meeting. And I'm like, holy cow, that is unbelievably simplistic and awesome. Write the location of where you were at. The reader really doesn't care at the end of the day, but what it does is when you're testifying on the witness stand six years later when that employee's accusing you of being a bigot, you're able to say, no, I treated this person fairly. I remember where I was when we had that interview. In fact, let me tell you what happened during that discussion. Next sentence. You informed me that you went to the doctor's office because you thought you had an appointment. I asked you why you didn't contact us. You indicated you forgot. You also indicated that you won't be late anymore. The reason you put that in there is that's the employee's explanation for their behavior. And say excuse. There's nothing that excuses tardiness generally unless it is an excused absence. But here if it's simply an unexcused absence, that's going to provide the explanation. The next paragraph is one that you're going to plagiarize over and over and over and over again. This tells the employee the importance of being on time, the importance of actually showing up to work. When you're late for duty, you disrupt the entire project schedule. You make other people's lives a living hell. Say it in nicer terms than that. And then we got the third paragraph. And this is where we're telling the employee how we know the employee knew he or she should not have been late. We're telling the employee, look, I've communicated this expectation to you on numerous occasions. On your first full day of employment, I discussed this matter with you. Your job description necessitates that you maintain prompt, predictable, and reliable attendance. By the way, for those of you in the audience, if you write job descriptions, that's really good buzz language to have in there if you actually expect people to show up for work at the work site. Next, this expectation is an essential function of your job, i.e., this isn't a simply a marginal function like making coffee. This is something that you're supposed to do. And next is telling the person, I asked you if they're during the hiring process, if there was any impediment to you showing up to work on time. I also asked you on your first day of employment and you indicated to me that there was not, i.e. a recurring pattern of us communicating the expectations of conduct and the employee understanding and receiving those expectations of conduct. And finally, we're telling the employee about the rules that we have and we're also reminding the employee about the importance of attendance as it relates to our company's mission, vision, and values. Pretty stock par standard paragraph. You're just going to tweak it and modify it for other given circumstances. So the employee's been late 10 times and they're getting in a written reprimand. I want to come work for you. You're a great manager. I get it. Supervisors don't deal with every single thing. They let things slide because they don't want the employee to be upset. They want to try to help the person grow and they feel that discipline is a last resort. And sometimes discipline is something that we should have done earlier and we have to own that issue. This paragraph helps the supervisor own the problem. On nine different occasions after my discussions with you, you've been late for work, i.e., we previously talked to the employee about being late, but we never dinged them for it. We never put something in the file. This sentence here is important. While I have been hesitant to write you up in an effort to give you a full and fair opportunity to demonstrate to me that you can meet the expectations of this position, I realize that disciplinary action should have occurred sooner to set the appropriate response and expectation. And then we're gonna identify for the employee the specific dates that they were late and when we had discussions for them. Kyle, how in the heck am I supposed to remember that? It's your job. You're supposed to know it. You're supposed to mark these things down. So you tell them the dates. And if you don't have the dates, you give approximations. And if you can't give approximations, you leave it open. You don't even include it. The last two paragraphs are going to be fairly similar paragraphs that might be incorporated into all of your letters. If you've previously had discussions with the employee about diligent, productive work, about completion of assignments, about other matters of professionalism that are factoring in your, into your decision as to why discipline is appropriate. This is a situation here where you're gonna mark these things down and let the employee know about it. And then the last paragraph is a fairly stock paragraph for you. Our department or our company can only properly function if employees maintain prompt, predictable, and reliable attendance and fulfill our reasonable expectations of employment. 
and I'm issuing you this disciplinary reprimand, and going forward, I may rely upon this for other decisions. And you have to understand that future misconduct may lead to discipline up to and including discharge. And then if you have any questions, I want you to tell me about it. Now, the bottom part is really important. We didn't put on here, I received this, but my signature does not connote that I agree to its contents. That's Bush League. Okay? Don't put stuff like that on your good, well-written letters. Your letter, the purpose of it is to communicate an expectation to the employee that they are to read this and they are to understand the expectations of conduct. If the employee disagrees with your findings, they can write a rebuttal and we'll staple the rebuttal to the letter. In 16 years of practice, I have never seen a rebuttal help an employee. It is almost like handing them a shovel and saying, you can write a rebuttal, and then they go and start digging their own grave. I've had employees that have lied in the rebuttal that have ended up costing them their jobs, but they can write a rebuttal. What I want the employee to simply acknowledge is I received this memorandum. I understand the directives and expectations given to me. I understand it is my responsibility to, to direct questions or concerns I have about this memorandum to my supervisor. I'm not asking them whether they agree with this. If they don't agree with it, they can have a meeting with you. Now, what if they don't want to sign it? Do you just write refuse to sign? No, that's Bush League. You wrote this nice letter and you're going to pollute it by handwriting refuse to sign on it. Don't do that. It looks terrible. Can I order the employee to sign it? You could. Why bother? Why not simply say to the employee, I understand that you don't want to sign this. Tell me why you don't want to sign it because I expect that you're going to sign this. All that I'm asking is that you acknowledge that you've received this and you understand the expectations of conduct. Well, I just don't want to sign it because I don't agree with it. You can write a rebuttal. I'm still not going to sign it. Now here's what you do. You write on there, on Wednesday, November 20, 2019, I met with Frank Gallagher at 9.31 a.m. and presented this memorandum to him. I explained to Frank that this memorandum was provided to him and that he was obligated to fulfill the expectations of conduct identified in the letter. Frank refused to sign this letter. This letter was given to him. He took a copy of it with him. A copy of this will be placed in his personnel file. Frank's going to now have that nicely written on the letter versus refuse to sign. Because what did we just do? We told the Equal Rights Division investigator, we told the judge, we told the jury that Frank was given the letter, that Frank was obstinate, that he provided, frankly, an unacceptable excuse for want, not wanting to sign it. And we said he's obligated to review the letter and to understand what he's supposed to do. And we put it in his file. And we're in a better position for defense of the employment decision later on down the line. This right here is the hardest thing for a supervisor to write. Once you do it, once you get good at it, your personnel management will go in a better direction. Happy to entertain any questions that anybody has. Otherwise, uh, I want to thank everybody for coming today. And Certainly uh, the opportunity for our firm, Von Briesen and Roper, I deal with employment issues, but we deal with a gamut of other issues in the construction arena, all the way from project management uh, adv uh, ad advice and contract advice, all the way to litigation when things go south. Um, so on behalf of the lawyers in our firm, I want to thank everybody for listening to me today and for giving me the opportunity to present. I want to thank AJC as well. Thank you. Yep. Fire away. Question? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, give me an example. Okay. Somebody's coming late. Yep. So the fair question to a coworker um, who may have seen Frank, let's say, arrive late is to say, what did you observe this morning with regard to Frank's arrival at the workplace? Well, I saw Frank got out of his truck and his boots were covered in blood. And then he walked over to the garden hose and sprayed him off. That's a cue to you to call law enforcement. Okay. So yes, it's a fair game question, and it also, is, it also shows when you say to that person, what time did Frank come in? Well, we were already on the scene, and we've been there for like a good 30, 40 minutes and everything, because I'd already had two cups of coffee in me. You have now fact-based information that you can document. That entire information there is going, to, is going to lend credibility to that person if, for example, they got to testify six years later, and we can say, you told your supervisor that you'd already had two cups of coffee. Do you drink coffee? I sure do. How much coffee do you drink? A lot. 
in an hour for the day. How much coffee do you have? Now that day I know I had two because I told the supervisor I had two. Well, you could have them write a statement which would be really helpful. Yep. Now you're going to run into the situation of is the employee going to write a statement? Sometimes you got to take good notes. Yep. Good. What's your second question? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. My recommendation is is that you maintain an investigation file. Um, yep. And generally outside of the personnel file. Employees have this mistaken belief that they have a right to review every single record that's in their personnel file. That's not true. They do have a right to review records that the employer relies upon for discipline decisions, which is why when you're taking notes and they are part of the formal record of the investigation, you should be comfortable with the employee seeing your notes. They, put, they likely have that right under the law. Now, with all that said, you may simply draft your investigation plan and then you write a report and your notes are just that and you chucked them and you pitched them. You didn't need them anymore because the general content is in your report. That would be there. You can choose to keep a report of that nature, certainly in the personnel file. That's the employer's right to make that choice. Um, but oftentimes employers will keep a separate investigation file. Good. What other questions have we got? Anything from the uh, online audience at all? No, everybody has learned exactly what they're supposed to do. Good. Good. Cutting back to the crux issue, remember the mission, vision, and values of a good guidepost. Any parting remarks at all? Or sure. All right. Um, thanks again, everyone, coming out. Uh, two points I will make. This is in my pre-AGC career. I did a fair amount with employment law, and, and Kyle's advice is, is spot on. I, I did work um, on the employer side, the employee side. Um, and, it, and it really was spot on. I found myself nodding along to a lot. So very good advice. Um, two pieces to this. There's one that, that kind of that letter we talked about, and sort of the back half of the, the presentation talked about. It's a little bit of a CYA. Okay, if this thing goes sideways, do I have proper documentation? Uh, do I handle it the right way? Am I going to be able to stand in front of a fact finder um, and come off looking like a good guy? Okay, that's extremely important. Lots of good advice. But what I what really jumped out at me um, is, is as right from the first slides from Kyle's is this should be part and parcel of just operating a good company. Um, we just did, this isn't a secret in the industry, it's, it's confirmed by salary, uh, the salary survey we just did here at AGC. Workforce development, workforce retention is the number one issue, um, I think across a lot of industries, but particularly construction. It's, it's a challenging industry, but there is no doubt that that is the number one issue for almost every single company. Um, and these are things that we all want to work in a place where we're treated fairly, where our concerns are addressed, um, and that's, that's really your best protection is, is to both this type of lawsuit, but just holding out a, work, a, a workforce. So this is important things, um, and unlike raises, unlike putting money into recruitment, this doesn't really cost you anything else. It's just good culture. It's just good planning. Um, so I would, I would keep that piece in mind that um, you know, if you work somewhere and you see a fellow employee that's treated unfairly or um, you don't think the discipline's right, you're going to start looking around. Um, but if you're, if you're in a place that you know the values, um, your supervisor follows the values, when someone violates them, it's very clear that it's a violation and what's going to happen to them and, and that um, discipline is meted out fairly, that's a way to hold on to employees. So I, I really appreciate that that's what Kyle led with and I think it's an important thing to keep in mind with all this is by having that foundation it's not going to help you protect you from um, potential lawsuits it's going to help you hold on to those employees which again is survey after survey after survey and then you and you guys and girls live it every single day and that's the biggest challenge facing the industry so i think this is part and parcel of that so that yeah that's no spot on thank you thanks folks <laughs> Can you